Hello everyone, welcome to Daily News Analysis of Shankar Ace Academy. Today's date is 29th of April 2024. Displayed here are the articles that we are going to discuss today. As you can see, we have taken articles from different newspapers. Also, we have given the old notes PPT in the comment section along with the new PPT. So make use of it and give your feedback in the comment section. Now let us move on to the first topic. Look at this article. Microsoft recently introduced PHI 3 Mini which is a smaller and more efficient version of their AI model family called PHI 3. These models are like brains for AI applications helping them understand and generate human-like languages. PHI 3 Mini is the first of three smaller models Microsoft plans to release and it's getting attention for its ability to outperform similar sized models in various tasks like understanding language, solving problems and even coding with Macs. What makes PHI 3 Mini special is that it expands the options for developers who want to use high quality language models in their AI applications. Their model with 3.8 billion parameters is now available on platforms like Microsoft, Azure AI Studio, Hugging Face and Olama. In this context, let us learn about small language models and large language models. See, firstly, language models are like the engines behind the AI applications that deal with the language. They are trained on lot of existing text data to learn how to do things like classify text, answer questions or generate text. Firstly, we shall see about small language models that is SLM. Small language models are AI language models that contains significantly fewer parameters compared to their larger counterparts such as GPT-4 or Gemini Advanced. While large language models that is LLMs boast hundreds of billions of parameters, small language models typically range from few millions to a few billion parameters. Despite their smaller size, small language models are demonstrating remarkable effectiveness in specialized tasks and resource constrained environments. Thanks to the advancement in training techniques, architecture and optimization strategies. Now let us see the applications of small language models. The veracity of small language models is one of the most compelling features finding applications in various domains like sentiment analysis, text summarization, question answering, code generation, etc. The compact size and effective computation of small language models make them well suited for deployment on edge devices mobile applications and resource constrained environment. For example, Google's Gemini Nano featured on the latest Google Pixel phones assists with text replies and summarizes recordings without requiring an internet connection. Microsoft's Arca 2 7B and Arca 2 13B are the other examples of small language models. Now we shall see about large language models. See, large language model is a type of artificial intelligence algorithm that uses deep learning techniques and massively large data sets. Know that it uses them to understand, summarize, generate and predict new content. Now, what are the features of large language model? Firstly, the term large symbolizes two things. They are enormous size of their training data and the parameter count. See, the parameters define the skill of the model in solving a specific problem. Secondly, they are used for general purpose. See, it is sufficient to solve general problems that are based on commonality of human language regardless of specific task. To put it simply, large language models is like a super smart computer program that can comprehend and create human-like text. Know that it is trained on massive data sets which are essentially patterns, structures and relationships with languages. Moreover, we can say that they are tools that help computers understand and produce human language. Now let us see the types of large language models. On the basis of architecture, long large language models are three types, autoregressive, transformer based and encoder decoder. See GPT-3 is an example of auto-generative model as they predict the next word in a sequence based on the previous word used. Secondly, Lambda or Gemini. They are formally called BARD. They are transformer based ones and they use a specific type of neural network architecture for language processing. Thirdly, encoder decoder models. This will encode a input text into a representation and then decode it into an another language or format. Now let us see the working of large language model. See at the core of this technique lies deep learning. It means training of artificial neural networks which are mathematical models. Note that they are believed to be inspired by the structure and functions of human brain. For large language models, this neural network learns to predict the probability of a word or a sequence of a word given in the previous 
words in a sentence as i mentioned earlier this is done by analyzing the patterns relationships between words in the data sets used for training once trained and large language model will predict the most likely next word or a sequence of words based on inputs also known as prompts now we shall see the key differences between small language models and large language models firstly specialization while large language models are trained on a vast amount of general data small language models excel in specialization through fine tuning achieving high accuracy and performance in narrow context secondly computational efficiency small language models require significantly less computational power and energy compa consumption compared to the large language models thirdly inference speed and latency the compact size of small language models enables them faster processing times making them more responsive and suitable for real time applications fourthly cost effectiveness the development and deployment of small language models are often most cost effective than large language models making them an attractive option for smaller organizations and research groups with limited budget so that's all about this discussion so in this article we have discussed about small language model and large language models with this let us move on to the next news article look at this faq article it talks about various election related issues like situations for declaring a candidate as unopposed the various rules under the representation of people's act to govern it and it also talks about a plea seeking fresh elections in the constituencies where no doubt votes in a majority so this is the crux in our discussion today we are going to see about this phenomenon in a brief firstly let us see how the candidate is declared as elected before the polling Recently the BJP candidate for Surat constituency got elected unopposed this was after the rejection of the nomination of a congress candidate and the withdrawal of other candidates this has sent shock waves in the political circle in this backdrop let us see the rules governing it see section 53 of 3 of the representation of people's act 1951 deals with the procedure in such uncontested elections see according to this provision if the number of such candidates is less than the number of seats to be filled the returning officer shall declare all such candidates to be elected note that the actions of returning officer are governed by section 33 of rpa on continuing our discussion after receiving the nomination paper the returning officer shall satisfy himself that the names and the electoral roll numbers of the candidate and his proposers are same as those entered in the electoral rolls this is the normal process but in surat three proposers of the congress candidate claimed that they had not signed his nomination form so the nomination of congress candidate got cancelled moreover the handbook for returning officers issued by the election commission states that if in any constituency there is only one contesting candidate that candidate should be declared elected immediately after the last hour for withdrawal of candidature so this is the process of uncontested elections secondly let us see about negative voting see negative voting refers to rejecting all the candidates in an election instead of choosing any of the contesting candidates in india it was exercised through nota that is none of the above the main objective of nota option is to enable electors who do not want to vote for any of the candidates and to exercise their right to reject option without any violation of the secrecy of their decisions even though it was introduced with an intention of exercising negative votes many activists and constitutional experts are criticizing it by calling nota as a toothless tiger with no implications on the results this is somewhat true as despite the fact that nota got over 1.29 crore votes in the state elections and lok sabha elections in the last 5 years and it did not alter the results in our electoral system this prompted a filing of many cases seeking fresh elections to the constituencies where nota scored majority in one such case the supreme court asked election commission to respond and give its view if such a verdict is given it will open new doors in the indian elections so this is all about this discussion with this let us move on to the next news article look at this hindu article it states that anti cyclonic circulations were the drivers of unusual rainfall over odisha it could also explain the historic dubai floods of april 17 so with this backdrop let us understand about cyclones and anti cyclones in a brief firstly what is anti cyclones see anti cyclones were weather systems with high atmospheric pressures at their center with air sinks towards the surface this sinking air spreads outwards as it reaches the ground in the northern hemisphere the movement is clockwise and the southern hemisphere it is counter clockwise so what are its effects see anti cyclones bring clear dry air and stable weather conditions they can cover very large areas and affect the weather over entire region like half of the usa they can also lead to cool weathers during their formation but tend to warm up as they move away from their origin now what are its types 
first one is cold anti cyclones these form over the polar regions and involve air sinking and flowing outwards towards the lower altitude next one is warm anti cyclones see these occur in subtropical regions due to air descending from higher to lower levels of the atmosphere next one is blocking anti cyclones these anti cyclones develop in mid latitudes and can stop the movement of other weather systems like cyclones now let us revise about cyclones cyclones are also known as hurricanes or typhoons in different regions they are intense low pressure areas with violent storms that originate over warm ocean waters primarily between the tropics now how does it form see first the warm ocean water heats the air above it causing it to rise this rising moist air cools and condenses forming clouds and releasing heat which warms the air further and causes it to rain more the rising air creates a low pressure at the surface pulling in more air from the surrounding this incoming air starts spinning due to earth's coriolis effect and strengthens the cyclone now what are the conditions needed for cyclones to develop the sea surface temperature should be above 27 degrees celsius and there should be a presence of coriolis force to initiate the spinning then there is a need for minimal changes in the wind speed at different altitudes next there should be an existing low pressure area then there should be a divergence in the upper atmosphere to pull air upwards so these are the main conditions for the development of cyclones now let us learn about temperate cyclones these cyclones occur in the mid latitudes between 35 degree to 65 degree and they are driven by interactions between polar and tropical air masses and creating fronts they move from west to east and are more common in the during winter now the main question here is that what is the role of anti cyclones in global warming see anti cyclones by circulating the warm air can affect temperature distributions and influence weather patterns in the context of global warming they can intensify heat waves or alter rainfall patterns contributing to extreme weather events understanding their behavior helps us to predict the impacts on the climate system which is crucial for preparing and mitigating climate change effects so that's all about this article with this let us move on to the next news article look at this article it talks about the report by the global trade research initiative that is tri it shows that india's imports from china increased from around 70 billion dollars in 2018-19 to over 101 billion dollars in 2023 to 2024 china's share of india's industrial goods has risen from 21% to 30% over 15 years chinese imports to india have grown 2.3 times faster than india's overall imports during this period china is the top supplier in eight key industrial sectors of india including machinery chemicals pharmaceuticals and textiles this contradicts the common belief that chinese imports are primarily high only in the electronic sector in this context let us understand the data about india's imports and exports first let us see the recent trends in trade the total goods exported in 2022 23 rose 6.03% to 447.46 billion dollars while the import bills surged by a steeper 16.5% to 714 billion dollars despite the global issues like russia ukraine war the us fed rate hikes etc india has surpassed its 2022 23 target of 750 billion dollars to hit 770.18 billion dollars which is 94 billion dollars higher than the last year's record exports now we shall see about india's major export arenas first one is engineering goods they registered a 50% growth in exports at 101 billion dollars in the financial year 2022 next one is agricultural products agricultural exports were buoyed by government's push to meet global demand for food amid the pandemic india's export of rice worth of 9.65 billion dollars is the highest among agricultural commodities next one is india's textile and apparels india's textile and apparel exports including the handicrafts stood at 44.4 billion us dollars in the financial year 2020 this is 41% increase from the last year government schemes like mega integrated textile region and apparel that is mitra park are giving a strong boost to this sector next one is pharmaceutical and drugs india is the third largest producer of medicines by volume and the biggest supplier of generic drugs india supplies over 50% of africa's requirement for generics around 40% of generic demand in the us and 25% of all medicines in the uk usa remained india's top export destination followed by uae while netherland emerged as the third largest goods buyer despite 
China to the fourth position in 2022 to 23. Netherlands share of Indian exports jumped from 3% in 21-22 to 4.7% in the year 2022-23. Note that Bangladesh and Hong Kong remained India's top 10 export markets although the value of shipments to their shores contracted from 27.8% to 9.9%. As of April to February 2022-23, India's top 5 export destinations are United States, United Arab Emirates, Netherlands, China and Singapore. Now, what about the India's imports? See, imports grew by 5.4% over November 2021. The decline in imports growth has been a more a balanced effect of declines in volume and prices. There is a fall in imports growth which suggests that India's domestic demand is weakening as the effect of a tighter monetary policy. India's top imports are mineral fuels including oil, organic chemicals, electrical machinery equipments, machineries including computers. According to the United Nations Comtrade database, India's top 5 import countries in 2022 were China, UAE, USA, Saudi Arabia and Russia. Note that the United States has become India's largest trading partner in 2022 to 23. The bilateral trade between India and US increased by 7.65%. So that's all about this article. With this let us move on to the next news article. Look at this article. The Union Home Ministry has provided aid for cyclone affected damage caused by Cyclone Michong and Tamil Nadu floods in 2023. For Michong 285.54 crores was approved and for the floods 397.13 crores was approved here the main point is that the funds were released under the national disaster response fund so in this context we shall revise what is national disaster response fund what are its statutory provisions what are the sources of financing and how the funds are used etc first what is national disaster response fund see it is a financial mechanism set up at national level under the disaster management act 2005 it is to meet the rescue and relief expenditure during any notified disaster here notified disasters are nothing but disasters notified by government of india for the purpose of providing assistance under the state disaster response fund and we know that recently government of india included covid-19 in the list of notified disasters note that every st- state will have a state disaster response fund so here we have national disaster response fund at national level and state disaster response fund at state level now let us see the statutory backing for these funds Note that State Disaster Response Fund is constituted under Section 48, Class 1 of A of the Disaster Management Act 2005, and National Disaster Response Fund is constituted under Section 46 of the same Act in order to supplement the funds of state. That is, in case of a disaster of severe nature, if adequate funds are not available for state, then the National Disaster Relief Fund gives funding to the state. Now we will see how the funds are allocated for. National Disaster Response Fund know that this fund is mainly funded through National Calamity Contingency Duty that is NCCD which is imposed on some specific goods like tobacco and tobacco related products petroleum products etc and the requirement of funds beyond what is available under this fund is met through budget provisions of the parliament moreover section 46 of disaster management act 2005 has a class for grants made by any person or institutions but provisions for such donations were not made by central government and now as we have seen in the news the government is going to make such provision for this also it is important to note that the funds under national disaster response fund is located in public accounts of government of india under the reserve fund under the category of reserve funds not bearing interest here reserve funds not bearing interest means the government of india is not liable to pay any interest for these funds from consolidated fund of india using tax payers money moreover the accounts of national disaster response fund are audited by the controller general of india that is cag now we will see how these funds are used know that national disaster response fund amounts can be spent only for meeting the expenses of disaster response relief and rehabilitation and in case of projects for mitigation of disasters a separate fund called national disaster management fund should be constituted by the government and here the allocation to state Dis- disaster response fund is decided by the finance commission and and the contribution is made by the center and states in the ratio of 75 is to 25 for the special category states the central government's contribution is 90% so that's all about this fund with this let us move on to the next news article Look at this article. This article highlights the significance of INS Vikrant, India's indigenous aircraft carrier, in enhancing country's naval capabilities. It emphasizes 
the development of DMR249 steel for the carrier showcasing India's technological advancement and self-reliance in the defense manufacturing. This article also underscores the operational capabilities of INS Vikrant. It mentions India's plan for a second indigenous aircraft carrier and the importance of maintaining a strong naval presence for safeguarding maritime interest and regional stability. So this is the crux. With this, let us see the main question related to security and discuss them. Look at this question. Why is it important that India should have a strong naval presence in the Indian Ocean region? Elucidate with the example. See, this is a specific question asking our opinion on the need for India to have a strong naval presence. So let's start answering. First, let us give one small introduction. See, in Indian Ocean region is an important strategic area with the unique characteristics like vital geographic locations in South Asia, vast landmass jutting into the Indian Ocean and critical sea lands essential for communication. See, India is in a pole position to play an important economic and security role in the region. In understanding this, India through bilateral exercises joint patrols, trainings, capacity buildings and hydrographic surveys plays a pivotal role in this region. This is all about the introduction. Now let us see the main body part of the answer. In the main body, we have to tell why is it important for us to have a strong naval presence in the Indian Ocean region. Firstly, with respect to its economic interests, India has a vast stake in the Indian Ocean waters. This is because it promotes and nourish global trade. Know that four out of six major global choke points lie in Indian Ocean region. An important example is the Strait of Malacca through which a quarter of world trade passes. Moreover, the Strait of Hormuz is a critical conduit of energy shipments from the Gulf region and for the flow of Asian workforce, capital and consumer goods etc. Secondly, with respect to the strategic interest, China's growing Indian Ocean presence is a serious threat to India's maritime security. This is further accentuated by the policies like string of pearl, building ports in Sri Lanka, strategic sites in Maldives etc. Moreover, it is a security threat for India as four countries in the Indian Ocean region, namely Djibouti, Laos, Maldives and Pakistan, find themselves vulnerable to above average debt to China, which is expanding its footprint. Thirdly, with respect to the connectivity, Indian Ocean region is an avenue for India for its outreach to the Middle East and Gulf countries. This is managed effectively with our maritime strategies like frequent ship visits and training etc. Moreover, Indian Ocean region plays a major role in India's future projects like India Middle East Economic Corridor which will amplify our global stature. The Gulf nations are very important for India for its energy security and diaspora connects. So it is in our interest to have strong naval presence to protect these assets. Fourthly, the Indian Navy. The Indian Navy has been deployed on various anti-piracy missions for countering Somali pirates off the east coast of Africa. This has increased India's image as a regional security provider. Moreover, with the recent geopolitical tensions like Israel Hamas war in Gaza and the attack of commercial vessels in the Red Sea by Houthi ter terrorists in Yemen, Indian Navy's role in Indian Ocean region has increased. Finally, to secure India's future ambitions, that is like India has multiple concerns about China in the Indian Ocean region. Out of it, the most important one is Chinese activities in India's exclusive economic zone. Many reports are saying that both Chinese research vessels and fishing boats have been seen in Indian Ocean, including in Indian exclusive economic zones. Moreover, India and Sri Lanka are locking horns for exclusive economic zone resources in Indian Ocean region. India is also having future plan policies like Samudrayan to explore polymetallic nodules in Indian Ocean region. In this context, it is in our best interest to have strong navy. So this can be your body part of the answer. Now coming to the conclusion, it can go like this. See, Indo-Pacific is increasingly becoming a center for growing geopolitical contest as China already making several moves ranging from strategic military bases to predatory economics to advance in this region. India should step up and successfully engaging countries in this region to a degree of success. Moreover, India can follow its policy of security and growth for all, that is Sagar, to enhance its geopolitical and geoeconomic interests in this region. So that's all about main answer writing practice. With this, let us see few other articles which were in news. 
first look at this article the national human rights commission is currently under scrutiny for its aggregation status this week a meeting in geneva will determine if the national human rights commission can maintain its a status this status is important because it affects the national human rights commission's ability to participate fully in the united nation human rights council and other international bodies the review focuses on concerns about this commission's independence including issues like involvement of police in its inv- investigations and lack of diverse representation while the indian government is making diplomatic efforts to retain the a status various international human rights groups a downgrade advocating for a downgrade citing india's declining human rights records and interference in the commission's operation the outcome will be decided soon in the upcoming meetings this is the crux let's move on to the next article look at this article the united states has rejected around one third of spice exports from mdh a well-known indian brand since october because of contamination with salmonella a type of bacteria following similar actions by hong kong and singapore who banned mdh and everest brand products due to the detection of carcinogenic pesticide in some items the food safety and standards authority of india fssai has started conducting checks on these products the rejection rate of mdh exports to the us has increased significantly in the last 6 months so this is about the article next This article is discussing voter turnout in the recent phase of Lok Sabha elections in India. It is comparing it with the previous years. Despite speculation that higher temperature might lead to lower voter turnout, the data shows there is little to no correlation between the temperature increase and the voting rates. In some parts, the voter turnout increased even with higher temperatures while in others, turnout decreased despite cooler temperatures. The trend holds even in urban areas although there is a slight indication that higher temperatures may have a minor effect on decreasing turnout overall factors other than temperatures seem to influence whether people choose to vote and further analysis is needed to understand the reasons for any change in voter participation next article it states that a true copy of painting indulekha by a famous artist raja ravi verma will be revealed at the kalimanur palace on his 176th birthday the original painting which came to public attention in 2022 is connected to a character from a classic malayalam novel and is noted for its intricate details it is also thought to have influenced verma's reclining lady the palace trust decided to display a copy instead of the original for safety reasons the unveiling ceremony will feature this copy along with other artworks related to verma's family and legacy so that's all about other articles now let us move to the prelims practice question discussion look at this question consider the following statements with reference to trade deficit first when money spent on imports exceeds that spent on exports in a country a trade deficit occurs this statement is correct next trade deficit can decrease a country's currency value this statement is also correct it is because when imports exceed exports country's currency demand in terms of international trade comes down so lower demand for currency makes it less valuable in the international market next one trade deficit allows countries to consume less than they produce this statement is incorrect because trade deficit allows countries to consume more than they produce because trade deficit means importing more and exporting less which means increased in consumption here they are asking how many of their statements are correct so the answer is option b only two look at this question consider the following statements the responsibility for disaster management is that of a union government this statement is incorrect because the primary responsibility of disaster management rests with the states the central government supports efforts of state government by providing logistical and financial support next statement the nodal ministry or management of natural disasters is the ministry of home affairs this statement is correct next statement the chairman of national disaster management authority is home minister this statement is incorrect because the chairman is prime minister so here the answer is option b only two take a look at this previous question with the present state of development artificial intelligence can effectively do which of the following understand the question properly and give your answers in the comment section displayed here is the mains practice question for you today understand the question and try to answer it in the comment section with this we come to the end of this news article discussion if you like the video do like share and subscribe to shankar ace academy now thank you so much for watching